All right, now that you guys are all amateur neuroscientists, I wanted to um, kind of cap off this week of the brain um, by telling you about one of at least the studies that I found most fascinating when I first learned about the brain. So I'm trying to position my head perfectly right here um, to illustrate that what we're going to be talking about is something called split brain syndrome, uh, a situation where the corpus callosum, the area right between the two hemispheres, is severed is cut down the middle, creating both a left brain and a right brain, I should be like, left brain and a right brain, um, within the same skull. Uh, and some of the really fascinating results you saw from those uh, experiments and what they tell us about perhaps the, the biggest question we have as psychologists, human consciousness. Here we go. All right, so week two, lecture eight, the last lecture of week two. Um, and yeah, it's all about the brain, but it, what I really want to do is bring together a lot of the things that we've been talking about. So I have emphasized a few times um, this structure between the two hemispheres. It's not the only place the two hemispheres join, but it is certainly the, the, the super highway of information, the, the part of the two brains that the two hemispheres that um, connects the two and allows information to flow freely between them. Now, why would anybody have their corpus callosum cut? Well, um, in virtually every case, the patients who did this had suffered from extreme forms of epilepsy. Now, in case you don't know much about epilepsy, it comes in different forms. Some are called petit mal seizures. People have seizures, but in the petit mal case, they, um, the seizures are, you might not even detect them. So I could have one right now, and I could just stare into space for a second and then come back. Um, and, and that could be a petit mal seizure, a little bit of electrical activity in the brain that kind of freezes me for a moment, um, but literally just for a moment. Um, but the more dramatic form is, is something called a grand mal seizure, uh, which if you translate is big bad. Um, so the big bad seizures. And, and what happens in a big bad seizure is that electrical activity starts in one side of the brain and then goes over to the other, but then gets arced back to the starting place and eventually forms a feedback loop. So it goes back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, getting stronger and stronger as it does so. And eventually, it literally short circuits the brain. Electrical activity starts going all through the brain. Um, the person normally passes out, but the electrical activity continues, and it stimulates the motor cortex randomly. Uh, and so that leads to convulsions because the motor cortex is being stimulated and so random muscles are moving. So you see a person on the floor usually because they're unconscious, but their body's moving and convulsing, uh, as we call it, uh, as a result of these seizures. So, you know, really horrible thing to have happen to you. Uh, most people state it's very embarrassing to, to suffer a grand mal seizure in a public place. Um, but for most people who have epilepsy, those sorts of grand mal seizures are relatively infrequent. However, for some people, they're extremely frequent. Um, some people, in fact, have had as many as five to 10 of these a day. And if, if you're one of those people, you reach a point where you don't even wanna go outside. You don't wanna be around other people. You don't wanna be in public because you have this constant fear of having a seizure and being embarrassed and you know having to explain to other people and quite potentially causing harm to yourself. If you have a seizure on a hard concrete floor in the middle of a highway, you know, if you were walking across the street and you suddenly have a seizure, it's a very dangerous thing. So for these kinds of students, uh, students, excuse me, patients, um, at one point, doctors started thinking, well, if this is caused by a feedback loop across the hemispheres of the brain, if we cut that superhighway and did not allow the hemispheres to speak to one another, then we should prevent the seizures. That should eliminate the seizures. I know it sounds pretty dramatic, eh? This is another one of those one-way changes to the brain. You can't undo this. But some patients felt their life was so horrible the way it was that they were willing to have their corpus callosum severed. So they went in, they had this procedure, and you know, essentially, as you see here, this whole structure was cut, leaving them with two hemispheres that could no longer communicate well with one another. So what happened? I mean, to some extent, you know, surely this, this was meant to help with their symptoms, but the doctors that were doing this in the first place, and, and these are very famous people now, Richard Sperry and Michael Gazzaniga, um, 
they were very interested in how this would change the person's being, how it would change their life. And initially, the answer was very surprising. It didn't seem to change them very much at all. They woke up from the seizure and, from all accounts, seemed to be the same person that, had, that they'd seen the day before the seizure, for example. However, over time, they noticed some strange things happening. Sometimes the, um, somebody would be asking the patients questions, and they would notice that the left hand of the patient would get agitated, um, while the rest of the patient didn't seem agitated. Or sometimes the left hand would start doing things. I mean, in one sort of relatively famous case, the left hand started grabbing nurses or hitting nurses or throwing objects across the room. And when anybody asked the patient, said, why are you doing that? They would say things like, I don't know. I didn't mean to do that. I, I have no idea. Um, and so there was this really kind of curious behavior going on. And so eventually, Sperry and Gazzaniga designed um, a study. I'm sorry, this, this was just to show you the severed cor corpus callosum. Um, and we went through why you cut it. So here's the study that they designed. They would have a bunch of objects in front of um, one of these patients who had their corpus callosum cut, and they would now show words, but they, they would cleverly, and this doesn't really do full justice to how they had to do this, but, it, but it's good enough. They would find a way to show the words in such a way so that only one or the other hemisphere would see them. So it all had to do with lenses on the eye. Each eye is actually divided into a left and right. Whatever falls on the right side of one eye goes to the left hemisphere, sorry, the right side of both eyes goes to the right hemisphere. Whatever falls to the left side of both eyes goes to the left hemisphere. So they had these special contact lenses and they could present words so that that word would ultimately, so for example, key, would ultimately only be um, registered in the left hemisphere, whereas ring would only be registered, I'm sorry, I'm getting this wrong, key would only be in the right hemisphere, ring would only be in the left. So you can, you know, just kind of trust me on this. You can, you can set up the apparatus so it would work that way. So now what we have is hemispheres that don't speak to each other, and when we present this, this hemisphere is seeing the word key, and this hemisphere is seeing the word ring. Now, if we ask the patient, what word did you see? they will say the word ring. Okay, now let's think about that. Why ring? Well, ring is the word that went into the left hemisphere and of course we know that speech is primarily in the left hemisphere. This is where Broca's and Wernicke's area is, for example, in the left hemisphere. So the speech hemisphere was seeing the word ring and that's what it said out loud. I see ring. Now, early on they just did these kinds of studies and what they noticed is that the left hand again would be very agitated. Almost like the left hand's like, almost like it's trying to say, no, that's wrong, that's not the word. And of course the left hemisphere is seeing the word, sorry, the right hemisphere is seeing the word key over here. Um, and the right hemisphere controls the left hand. That's that contralateral wiring I told you about. So eventually they would lay, they decided to lay objects out. And what they found is if they again asked the question, what did you see, the left, the right hemisphere which controls the left hand, this left hand would reach out and choose the object that the right hemisphere saw. So the person would verbally say, I saw the word ring, but they would reach out with their left hand for the, for the key and the left hand saying, no, I saw the word key. Really fascinating. It's, it's suggested to them that there is almost, essentially, two consciousnesses now inside this one skull. By splitting the brain in half, it seems as though the mind has been split, and that there are now two entities within the same brain. Extremely fascinating. And it got even kind of more fascinating as they tried to mine this more. At some point they came up with the, with the following study. I hope nobody's offended by a picture of a relatively attractive woman with relatively few clothes on, because here we go. They would present something like this to the patient very quickly. Um, present this image, um, but they would present it so that only the right hemisphere would see the image. 
not the speech, not the left hemisphere. Um, and so what would typically happen is that the patient would blush. Okay, and it's kind of uncomfortable to see an image like this while you're sitting in a, in a testing room with a bunch of you know, people in lab coats around you. Um, and so the person would blush. But here's the interesting thing. When the, when the doctor said, why are you blushing? The person wouldn't just say, I don't know. They would say, and that's, let's be clear about this, when they're speaking, it's the left hemisphere speaking, and the left hemisphere did not see the picture. But they would say things like the following, oh, um, I just thought of a, a bit of an off-color joke. I just remembered this off-color joke, and it kind of embarrassed me to remember it in this situation. And they would say, well, tell us, what, what was this joke? And the person would typically say something like, oh, I, I can't remember right now, and I, I, I don't want to tell it anyway, I, but, but, that's, but that's why I blushed. Okay. Now, why is this interesting? It's interesting because the person showed, like, what you'd expect the left hemisphere to say is, I did not see anything. But instead, it looked like the left hemisphere, the one with speech, convinced itself of a new reality that explained its behavior. It's like the left hemisphere noticed the blushing, felt the blushing, could could from previous associations could identify in a vague sense where that blushing came from. That blushing came from some sexually inappropriate thought occurring in this context. So it's like the left hemisphere could get there. Um, and then it built a story around that. It, it created this story that was consistent with its behavior. And this started a whole notion that's, that's still alive and well in psychology and debated pretty rigorously about the role of consciousness. There are some figures in psychology who believe that this is really what consciousness does, that our behavior in the real world is in fact influenced primarily by stimuli around us. Um, and so the stimuli just evoke certain behaviors in us and then we essentially watch ourselves and tell ourselves stories that explain why we behave that way. So that consciousness is, in a sense, interpreting our behavior, coming up with a theory, and then we own it. Once we come up with a theory, we believe that theory to be true. And this kind of notion of consciousness coming after the fact, you know, really flies in the face of the notion of us consciously deciding to do things. So it's really fascinating, and these split-brain studies really fueled that uh, whole notion. I mean, it's really to really get a sense of the split-brain phenomenon, you really need to see somebody. So I've got a video here of Joe, the split-brain patient, um, where you can actually see a, a split-brain patient behaving in some of the ways I've told you about. So really check that out because that that'll make it. I think it'll make the the magic. Is it magic? I don't know if magic is the right word, but the, but the the oddness of it um, really stand out. Um, this is a, a video of Michael Gazaniga himself, um, so you can get a sense of the personality, and he'll talk about the split brain uh, studies a little bit. So hear a little bit from somebody that was right there. Um, and now we have a couple of readings. So one is a Nature article all about split brain studies, A Tale of Two Halves, uh, and another one is a, an article in Psychology Today. Um, so written in a cert different levels, but again, all about the same phenomenon and the impact it has had on our understanding of the brain, the connections between the hemispheres, and how this all relates to human consciousness. Very cool stuff, and I think it'll really make you have a, have a deep and intense appreciation of those three pounds of tissue in, in our skull. All right, cool. So that wraps up week two. Um, we're going to have a, a little bit of a, a activity after this week, so, so check out for that for the announcements. Um, and then we're going to continue on our way through a bunch of fascinating psychology experiments. And I, I look forward to doing that with you. Have a great time. I'll see you next week. Bye-bye.